Hey Wargamers, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough. Now, as you may have known, last week, several of the episodes of the week were sponsored by a game called Rune Lords, which is launching on Kickstarter right now. And I had said multiple times in those kind of ads that I made for them that I really think you'll enjoy this game. Problem is, because of some streaming software issue that I did get resolved, I wasn't able to actually like go through the parts of the game that I think that you would really like. So I'm gonna do that today. I'm gonna to talk to you about why I think this actually is a really cool game that you might like using your models for Warcry or Underworlds or any of the other games that we talk about here normally. So in this video, I'm gonna cover some of the different game mechanics that I think really make Rune Lords unique in a very crowded gaming space when it comes to um, having all different kinds of mechanics and how it can stand out on its own and be a cool opportunity for you and your game group to have a lot of fun with models you already own. So the first thing I want to cover is talking about deployment and win condition. These things are managed by whatever game format you're playing. When you buy Rune Lords, you're actually buying four different kinds of games in one. They just use the same kind of mechanical system. Those uh, different modes are Resistance, Blitz, Blood Metal Mayhem, I don't know why I trip over that one in my head, and Rune Lord Royale. Essentially what these are, are different kind of formats based around, you know, are we hunting for objectives? Are we trying to do just straight kill points? Things like that. Your mission and game format are also going to manage how you deploy. Now, one thing I do like about Rune Lords is that instead of having very uh, isolated deployment zones, like across from each other or something like that, most of the time you're deploying outside of two to three hexes of an enemy unit. You can actually scatter yourself all across the board uh, as long as the mission will dictate how far away you have to be from enemy units. The reason I like this is because it gets you in the action faster. You're not wasting a turn with all the positioning and things like that. You can set up, set traps immediately and use terrain to your advantage turn one. And while four formats might sound a bit cumbersome, they're all written in very plain English. It's just, it's like, hey, listen, if there's uh, one player do X and so on. It just tells you what to do because uh, there is a single player mode. Um, and then the restrictions as far as model placement, it'll say like you can't deploy within and there's a specific number of hexes. It's all very plain English, very easy to understand. So like I said, action starts much faster and I like that quite a bit. And um, those actions that you're running to do actually have a lot more depth because of sort of the action economy that makes this game unique. You see, in most Games Workshop games that I cover here, like Necromunda or Warcry, even though those are very different games, essentially they boil down to pick a guy, they get two actions and you have a list and all those kinds of things depending on how the game mechanics play. Well, in Rune Lords, every single character or model, if you're using your own models, has its own unique set of actions right there on their card. They're very easy to understand. They tell you exactly how to resolve them. Uh, and in addition to that, there is a universal action sheet. But what makes this unique is that you're using three different resources to do those. And the action economy is based around these three little, um, what do I call them? I call them resources, I'm not sure what else to call them, but they're indicated by these yellow, green, and white symbols. Now what's cool about this system of having like these three different, you know, uh, mechanics and resources that you can spend for abilities is that you can spend all three and go like Super Saiyan Hulk and have your guy just be all kinds of crazy awesome, or you can actually bank the white tokens. So that means uh, essentially you can go, you can use the yellow, use the green to attack, maybe, you know, get set up for a good defense or plant a trap, something like that. But the white one is unique in that you can bank it because that gives you a chance to spend it in a reaction, meaning your opponent charges you, tries to hit you with an ax, and then you can spend that to counterattack or defend or whatever is written on the character's card. So by adding more resource mechanics, things like that, where now your actions are dependent on a, like a limited resource, these tokens, now you can act, react in real time, and then you can kind of set traps from there. Like I said, what I'm trying to get at is that there's a lot of levers you can pull. You can definitely play defensively with how you bank those white ones. You can also just go, like I said, full Hulk and just have all of your guys rush forward and try to use as many of their action uh, economy tokens, whatever, as they can. Now, all of the characters that you have on the table can do this. Um, there are some like chaff units that each side is given for free that can't, but they're really just they exist to like uh, set up defensive lines and that kind of stuff. The truth is um, one of those characters though, stands above the rest. And that is of course the Rune Lord. It's the main character. It's the story, the champion that this whole game is centering around. 
and two things make the Rune Lord incredibly cool and powerful, and this is why I like it for storytelling, especially like, you know, me as someone who really loves Path to Glory and that kind of stuff, is simply that with the Rune Lord, one, they get to go twice. No matter what, no matter what the Rune Lord is, they get to go twice. And so if they die, their your action economy takes a huge hit because they are your best piece, but they're also the one that's gonna do the most work throughout the game. The second thing, though, that I like is that you get to level them up in real time. You see, next to your kind of Rune Lord's section, uh, card section, there's a little table with a bunch of traits. And these traits throughout the game can get leveled up very easily just by discarding a special card known as the Facilitator. And it lets you just kind of level things up incrementally. So when you start the game, your Rune Lord is just a normal person Maybe some pretty good attack profiles, but nothing amazing, but they can go twice. By the end of it, they could be like a god of war, accumulating all these points and these abilities, and I like that. Again, you know me, you know that I like Warhammer stuff when the Chaos Gods bless things and they get like supercharged with tentacle arms and all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, Rune Lords do something very similar. And their kind of mechanics, the, the attributes that you increase, have very real consequences for the game. Things like the size of your hand and how many cards you can have in your hand. Um, it can make your dice rolls better for their attacks. It can uh, inspire people nearby. All kinds of cool things. Now there are a few like little crunchy parts of the rules that I want to touch on because as much as all those things I just covered allow you to create a really cool story for like a champion who's just going hog wild on an enemy, uh, I do think there are some other crunchy parts that will help you kind of nudge you in the right decision when it comes to picking up this game because it's so cool. The game engine here is known as the Sovereignty Game Engine, and it uses a series of tiered dice. So what that basically means, instead of rolling buckets and buckets of dice to represent how effective something is, you're actually gonna be rolling one dice. However, that dice, like I said, is tiered. So um, essentially it goes black, green, blue, orange, and purple. And each of those dice have critical chances, things like that, so for their special abilities on cards. And um, there's even mechanics like, uh, let's say, uh, inspire or intimidate. What that means is, say your, your soldier next to your hero normally rolls a green dice, right? It's good, but it's not, it's not great, it's not stellar. If you're, they are inspired by your hero, well then they use the next better die. You know, and then you can do the same thing to your opponent in reverse where you intimidate your enemy and they use a worse die. So what you're doing essentially is mitigating the kinds of math that your opponent's gonna throw at you and buffing up what you can do to your opponent. And of course, there's stuff like rerolls and things like that. Now, some other mechanics that are helpful for storytelling are conditions. Now, I know if you are new to tabletop gaming, the idea of conditions and things like that can seem a bit overwhelming because it's like a lot of extra rules that are layered on top, but they really go a long way to one, telling a story, and two, they are incredibly simple. And when I say simple, I mean it's things like a uh, crippled limb, which just affects your movement, um, bleeding, poison, that kind of stuff. It's extremely straightforward. Everything is pretty much condensed into one sentence and so for each condition. And so I think it's very, very easy to pick up and learn, but also they create this immense variety of stuff when it comes to like, again, poison traps or um, having weapons that make your opponent bleed and what that means for combat. All of these things go together to telling a story on the table. Now, something that's very important to me and I've mentioned it multiple times on the channel is uh, simplicity. Whenever I see a, a, a tabletop game that has a lot of cards, I get very nervous. Because if you guys have followed me, you know that that's kind of my main hang up with Underworlds is that I don't like the deck building aspect. The good thing is, is that every single character in Rune Lords has a pre-designed 50 card deck that is balanced around them specifically. So it is super simple. You just plug and play that way. The cool thing though is there is a format known as the, I believe it's called the sovereignty part, where basically you can mash all the, the hero decks together and then you and your opponent build your own custom ones, ignoring you know which faction they come from. And so that can actually lead to some really cool game moments because maybe uh, your archer lady is using a massive cleave attack from a Viking Nord that normally she wouldn't have access to, but because you put the decks together in this little economy game, it she gets access to it. And so that's really the awesome part is that there's a lot of playability once you get comfortable with your standard 50 card deck. 
And one thing that kind of helps with the deck building aspect to me is that at, at the end of any of your turns, you can discard any cards you don't want and then draw up to your five card hand. And again, the five card hand is modifiable with uh, your hero getting special abilities and stuff like that buffed up. So my point is there, I, I guess I like the idea of being able to discard everything. So it kind of lowers my feel bads when I create a custom deck that's absolute hot garbage and I draw a hand that's even more hot garbage. Just all the worst cards and there's nothing to do. Just chuck them, get a new hand, and you can keep playing. Now the last little bit here I want to touch on is uh, terrain and line of sight. Now obviously if you're looking at the board here, uh, it is totally flat cardboard. You can, you can reconfigure it quite a bit. Uh, but the truth is, there's no physical terrain. However, that does not mean that there's no terrain rules within the context of the game. You see, it uses this great hex-based system. Line of sight is very simple to determine because if the center of one hex can be have a, a straight line drawn to the center of another without crossing a solid or dotted line, uh, or kind of on the edges, how they determine like walls and things like that, then you are good to go. You don't need to worry about um, not being able to see them. However, when it comes to actual terrain, because of the little markings on the edge of each hex, that is telling you, one, you need to fly to be able to get through this hex into the next one. There's stuff, again, like flying, there's climbing, there's swimming, all kinds of actions. And so it actually, through the rules, cr does create uh, a very dynamic board. So you can use terrain to your advantage throughout the game. You can hide inside of a building where people can't shoot you. If you go near a window, which has little dotted lines, all of a sudden they can. Right now you're kind of open because they can see you through the window and shoot you from there. I like that kind of stuff. So uh, again, even if it doesn't look like it because it is a flat tile game, there are actually quite a few terrain rules here if you choose to use them. Really the most important thing to me, honestly, is just being able to use the terrain rules to tell like, cool stories or use them to your advantage. So like, again, hiding inside of a building, shooting out through the windows with an archer, things like that. There's a castle walkway on one side. Uh, you can shove people off of that. Stuff like that I think is just so cool. So friends, those are the reasons why I really do actually love Rune Lords. It is a super easy game to pick up. When you look at the card, all the information you'll ever need is right there on it. So there's no universal rules in the rule book, nothing like that. Um, once you learn your cards, uh, which you can reference at any time, it's a lot of open information between you and your opponent. And uh, the only thing you can't show is your hand, but honestly, a lot of the cards function very similarly, so there's no gotcha moments. Uh, once you learn you know, the cards in your hand and um, the, the basic, very basic status effects, you're on your way to storytelling with these games. I Honestly, it has, I, I think if Warcry had launched with this much depth to it, it would have been received in a much more positive way because even though it lacks three-dimensional terrain or models, it does all the things that skirmish games need to do to create those epic moments of heroes just hacking and slashing and leveling up in real time. You got guys on walls who are being kicked off. You got dudes in buildings shooting at windows, setting traps as they go. It's all really cool. So anyway, friends, go ahead and check this out. Their uh, Kickstarter is almost over. They're very cool people at that company. And it's all based around a game, uh, sorry, based around a series of award-winning fantasy novels. Go check them out if you'd like. I really do think you'll enjoy it. More indie game creators are important for us and our industry, so go check it out. So anyway, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.